Can't You Make Them Behave, King George by Jean Fritz. The genre is narrative nonfiction. Narrative nonfictions tell about people, places, and events that are real. As you read, look for events that are in time order or chronological order, as well as factual information that tells a story. Before the American Revolution, most people who had come from England to settle in North America were English subjects loyal to King George III. However, some of these colonists did not like that the king made them pay money called taxes to the English government. They did not like that they had no say in the decisions made by the English government. This was the beginning of a disagreement that led to the American Revolution. When George came to the throne, the government was costing a great deal. England had been fighting a long and expensive war, and when it was over, the question was how to pay bills. Finally, a government official suggested that one way to raise money was to tax Americans. What a good idea, King George said. After all, the French and Indian part of the war had been fought on American soil, for the benefit of Americans. So why shouldn't they help pay for it? The fact that Americans had also spent money and lost men in the war didn't seem important. Nor did the fact that Americans had always managed their own money up to now. They were English subjects, weren't they? Didn't English subjects have to obey the English government? So, in 1765, a stamp tax was laid on certain printed items in America. King George was amazed that Americans objected. He was flabbergasted that they claimed he had no right to tax them. Just because they had no say in the matter? Just because they had no representatives in the English government? What was more, Americans refused to pay. If they agreed to one tax, they said, what would come next? A window tax? A tax on fireplaces? Now, King George believed that above all, a king should be firm. But the government had the vote, and in the end, it voted to repeal the tax. Still, King George was pleased about one thing, that the government stood firm on England's right to tax the American colonies. And in, eight, in 1767, the government tried again. This time, the tax was on lead, tea, paint, and the number of items England sold to America. Part of the money from this tax was to be used to support an English army to keep order in America. Part was to pay governors and judges previously under the control of the colonies. Who could object to that? King George asked. Americans had also contended that if they had been asked instead of being forced to raise money for England, they would have done so, as they had done on previous occasions. In King George's day, the king was a constitutional monarch. He had lost the enormous powers that a king had once had and had to abide by the vote of the government. On the other hand, unlike present kings, he did take an active and leading role in his government. The Americans did. They hated the whole business so much, especially the English soldiers stationed in their midst, that even when the other taxes were repealed and only the tea tax remained, they would not put up with it. When tea arrived in Boston, they dumped it into Boston Harbor. When he heard this news, King George felt more like a father than he ever had in his life, a father with a family of very, very disobedient children. And of course, he must punish them. So he closed the port of Boston, and he took away the right of Massachusetts to govern itself. Many Americans disapproved of the Boston Tea Party. They were willing to pay for the lost tea. But when instead the king punished them so severely, they became more united against him. Firm, firm, firm. From now on, he would be firm. After the Battle of Lexington and the Battle of Bunker Hill, King George said that he felt as strong as a lion. People would soon see, he said, that Americans would back down, meek as lambs. Instead, on July 4th, 1776, Americans declared their independence. Naturally, King George was annoyed, but he wasn't worried. How could children, however, however rebellious, succeed against a firm father? How could a few colonies hold out against a powerful empire? He'd just send a few more regiments over and then watch the Americans come around. It never occurred to George III that he might not be right. I wish nothing but good, he once said. Therefore, everyone else who does not agree with me is a traitor or a scoundrel. For a while, King George had every reason to feel confident. The English troops captured New York, and when George heard this, he said, One more battle, and it would be over. When he was told that his troops had marched into Philadelphia, he ran into the Queen's room. I have beat them, he shouted. Beat all the Americans. 
but he hadn't beaten them. The fighting went on, and meanwhile George the Third had to go about the business of being a king. He put his seal on official papers, gave out medals and titles, memorized the name of every ship in the navy, tasted the food sent to the troops, checked on who was spending what, and for hours on end he listened to people talk. Indeed, being a king, especially a good king, was often boring. He couldn't even drop a glove without half the palace, it seemed, stooping to pick it up and arguing about who should have the honor of returning it. Never mind the honor, the king once said. Never mind, never mind, never mind. Just give me my glove. What, what, what? Yes, yes, you all picked it up. Yes, 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 yes. All, all, all. You all picked it up. King George had a habit of talking rapidly and repeating himself, so his talk often sounded like gobble. But, as a king, he did have a few advantages. He was, for instance, the most prayed-for man in the empire. Naturally, it was pleasant to think of the heavy traffic of prayers ascending on his behalf every Sunday morning, from every country church and every city cathedral, in every corner of the kingdom. But not in America. There the preachers gave up praying for him when the punishment started. The king was also the most toasted man. No party, except in America, began without all the people present raising their glasses and wishing the king a long life. The king wished it, too. And he had the biggest birthday celebrations. Each year on June 4th, all his subjects, except in America, of course, celebrated his birthday with parades and banquets and speeches and gunfire and fireworks. All those prayers and toasts and fireworks were not to be sneezed at. Still, there were times when George wanted to forget about being a king. Fortunately, he had hobbies to turn to. For one thing, he made metal buttons. He loved turning a lathe. He wrote articles on farming and signed himself Ralph Richardson, which was the name of one of his shepherds. He played backgammon with the officers of the royal household, and he collected ship models and coins and clocks and watches. He even had a four-sided clock that even showed the tide. He also played the flute and harpsichord, hunted and studied the stars in his private observatory, and for the queen's special amusement, he maintained a zoo which consisted of one elephant and one zebra. But always, in the end, he had to go back to being a king, back to the problem of America. This was the way he thought of America, a problem. King George did not really think of the Revolutionary War as a war until the fall of 1777, when 5,000 English soldiers surrendered to the Americans at Saratoga. In 1788, when the king was 50 years old, he became violently ill of a disease that has since been diagnosed as porphyria. One of the symptoms of the disease is that one's mind is affected, but in those days people thought that the king had simply gone mad. He recovered from his first attack, but in later years suffered again. For the last ten years of his life, he was a wretched-looking figure, dressed in a purple bathrobe with wild white hair and a wild beard. He died in 1820 at the age of 82. How could such a thing happen, the king asked. Hadn't he been told, even by an ex-governor of Massachusetts, that Americans would give up? That only a small number of Americans were really against him? And how could he, a peace-loving king, find himself in an honest-to-goodness war with his own colony? He tried to console himself. He was a good king, he said. Good kings deserve to win. So this must be a temporary setback. All he had to do was show the world that he wasn't the least bit worried. So that night, after hearing about the defeat, King George went to a court party and spent the evening telling stupid jokes and laughing so uproariously that his prime minister, Lord North, had to take him aside and try to quiet him down. The war dragged on. France, impressed with the victory at Saratoga, joined the war on America's side. There were people in England now who wanted to stop fighting, but not George. No, no, no. Never, never. No independence. No peace without honor. If one group of English colonies got away with got away, what would happen to the others? What would be left of the empire? But no matter how he showed himself in public, privately, George was depressed. The world was not staying settled, everything in its place the way he liked it. Not only was America acting up, but there were difficulties in England as well, riots even. And George's own family was misbehaving. Two of his brothers were involved in scandals, and George's son, the Prince of Wales, was so contrary, he deliberately arrived for meals as much as an hour late, although he knew that the king wanted everyone to be exactly on time. 
On November 25, 1781, the news reached London that the English army under General Cornwallis had surrendered at Yorktown to General Washington. When Lord North, North heard this, he threw up his arms. It's all over, he said. But the king said nothing was over. They still had ships, hadn't they? He named them. They still had officers. He learned their names, too. They still had troops. They still had guns and gunpowder. King George set his wits firmly and wrote a letter to the Secretary of State for America. This defeat, he said, should not make the smallest difference in their plans. Still, King George was so upset that when he dated the letter, he forgot to record the hour and the minute of the writing. Two days later, the king addressed the government. I prohibit you from thinking of peace, he thundered. But the government did think of peace, and eventually, the government voted for it. So now what? King George couldn't fight the war all by himself. He couldn't chop off the heads of all those who had voted for peace. Kings didn't do that anymore. He could, of course, abdicate, quit the king business altogether, and for a time he thought seriously of this. He even drafted an announcement of his abdication. But then he put it away in his desk. He was so used to being a king. So when the time came for him to sign the peace proclamation, he signed. As soon as he finished, he jumped on his horse and took a hard gallop away from the palace. When the time came to announce in public the separation of the two countries and the independence of America, he swallowed hard and announced. Afterward, he asked a friend if he had spoken loudly enough. As long as he lived, King George had nightmares about the loss of the American colonies. It certainly hadn't been his fault, he said. He hadn't done anything wrong. He had just wanted to teach Americans a lesson.